So Dr. Scholz, today we're talking about Gleason 8, specifically 4 plus 4. So a lot of people get this on the pathology report, and they want to know what does it mean, especially in newly diagnosed cases. So what is your explanation of Gleason 8 prostate cancer? Well, the, what they're talking about is the way the cells look under the microscope. And these experts, pathologists who only look at microscopes all day long, can predict, based on the appearance of the cells, whether this type of cancer is more or less likely to spread outside through the bloodstream into the lymph nodes or into the bones. And that, of course, is the defining issue uh, in deciding how aggressive a treatment is required. Uh, they, they can scale treatment up or scale treatment down in the prostate cancer world, and they use information like the Gleason score to determine if you want to be uh, more aggressive. Do you want to add hormone treatments? Do you want to add treatment to the pelvic lymph nodes on the possibility there's cancer out there? So this is uh, one of the most important factors in determining how risky this individual's cancer is and how likely it is that it could spread outside the gland. So how does one go about confirming that it's absolutely Gleason A 4 plus 4? Doctors that are looking through the microscope, we call them pathologists, they do come in different skill levels. Uh, some have more experience with prostate cancer, others less. and. If there is uncertainty about the quality of the pathology department, you can get a second opinion at different reference centers, uh, such as Johns Hopkins has been a favorite of ours. They uh, do a lot of prostate work there. And those are a way for confirmation. 10, 15 years ago, we had a lot more problem with people misreading Gleason scores. It's, it's become a little more mainstream. And so I don't routinely have everyone with Gleason 8 uh, re-read. It's not a really difficult diagnosis, but if there were any reason to question, it's easy to double check. So before we move further, I, I want to clarify something. I think a lot of people see that they're in a Gleason 8 category and they it's more serious and they get very concerned about survival rates. So can you talk about survival rates with Gleason 8 prostate cancer? And it's not just that it's Gleason 8. I think the word cancer itself, uh, people are so familiar. It's cancerous you know, right up there with heart disease is one of the most common causes of death. And what people don't seem to be able to grasp readily is how different prostate is from, say, lung cancer, colon cancer, liver cancer, pancreas cancer, where people could be dead within months from those horrible diseases. And they're not uncommon. So most people have had a brush with that in a family member or a friend, and the word cancer is truly terrifying. Prostate is uh, I don't really have an easy description for it because it, when people die of prostate cancer, it's usually after they've had it for 10 to 20 years. That's a different issue. Uh, and then, of course, there's this assumption that everyone that gets it is at risk for dying, and that's not true. Over 200,000 people are diagnosed every year in the United States. The mortality rates in the United States are about 20,000 people a year. So maybe 10% of people that have prostate cancer could go on and die, but that won't be for another 10, 15, 20, or 25 years with existing technology. Now there's so much new stuff out, maybe those people that were projected to die won't even die because of new discoveries. So the death rates are low, cure rates are incredibly high, even if it is a Gleason 8. And if people are screened and caught at an early stage, almost all of them will be cured. So what are factors that would determine treatment for Gleason 8? Well, we have to look at a number of factors because you could have people with a small amount of Gleason 8, say uh, a young person with a small amount of Gleason 8. You could have an older person with a small amount of Gleason 8. Then if, what if someone has a Gleason 8 but they have uh, a large tumor or seminal vesicle invasion or lymph node involvement or even uh, spread to the bones? These uh, are all different angles on what we call Gleason 8, and the amount of Gleason 8 uh, determined by scans, determined by how high the PSA is, determined by if they had a random biopsy, how many cores have cancer in them. Uh, so I would say the next issue, if someone has a Gleason 8, how, what age group are they in, how much cancer is present? After you're done with all the scanning, uh, we believe as of 2022, everyone should be getting a PSMA PET scan to determine extent of disease. It's a fabulous new technology. But uh, we need to have a sense of uh, what kind of a Gleason 8 is it. We're
we're in a world where PSMA PET scans are new and the common way most practiced for years has been determining the risk of spread has been based off of the Gleason score. So if that's the case and now PSMA PET scan, how has PSMA changed how you would determine risk of spread? Well, it's a free for all right now because we don't have long-term clinical trials, you know, giving PSMA PET scans and seeing based on those results what the 10-year outcomes are going to be. We have to project on what we think is going on. If we go back to the fact that Gleason score was to help you determine if there was any cancer spread, and if a PSMA PET scan, which is a very accurate scan, says there's no cancer spread, then should a Gleason 8, which previously told us there's a high risk of cancer spread, still push us towards aggressive multimodality therapy. The standard treatment in the past was to give radiation to the prostate and the lymph nodes in 18 months of uh, testosterone deprivation. Pretty heavy-handed stuff, but thought to be necessary to ensure optimal cure rates. So now if a PSMA PET scan shows no spread, can we uh, lighten up and treat these people more like an intermediate risk? We, we know that a negative PSMA PET scan, in other words, a scan showing no spread, in a Gleason 8 uh, is going to be accurate about four out of five times. So the chance of relapse, if you treat the prostate alone, is only going to be about 20%. 20% sounds high, but if you add 18 months of hormone therapy and radiate the pelvic lymph nodes, you're only going to improve the cure rates about 50%, which means you'll go from a 80% cure rate to a 90% cure rate. You have to treat nine people to benefit one person with 18 months of hormone therapy and pelvic uh, lymph node radiation. These sorts of numbers need to be run by the patients and they can decide because we also know that PSMA PET scans are going to catch recurrent disease at a much earlier stage than we've ever been able to do before. We, we're going to be able to cure some of those people that have recurrences. And they find a little lymph node in the pelvis, treat it aggressively at that juncture, Maybe half of those people will be curable. So there's your 50% reduction improvement in cure rates right there, but then you don't have to treat everybody with 18 months of hormone therapy to get that. So I'm, I know I've moved through quickly with a lot of numbers, but the bottom line issue here is that we have to start modifying our thinking about Gleason 8 when we have a PET scan showing no spread. If we have a PET scan that shows metastatic disease in the lymph nodes, for example, uh, then it's pedal to the metal. We know that this individual has a type of cancer that has the genetic capacity to spread. This is dangerous, potentially life-threatening. They certainly need 18 months of hormone therapy. Uh, they need radiation to the pelvic lymph nodes. And some of these people maybe should get a short course of chemotherapy to that'll improve their cure rates 10 to 15%. Pr improving cure rates 10 to 15% in someone with a known cancer that can metastasize is valuable. Improving cure rates 10% in people that don't, we're not even sure their cancer can metastasize um, would be justifiable if the treatments were very innocuous, but they're not. The 18 months of hormone therapy is a life-changing experience for people, and uh, people are well aware of that now. So we're trying to balance out the, the toxicity of the treatment with the how much real value are you getting out of these aggressive therapies. I think one thing I really appreciate about the PSMA PET scan is not only are we seeing the cancer, but it has the capacity to really affect the quality of life of the patient throughout the treatment and after the treatment. The difference between going through a short course of hormone therapy versus 18 months of hormone therapy is massive. And the, the side effects of hormone therapy, I mean, we hear about it all the time, the fatigue and the hot flashes and everything that they go through, it's a lot. So. Um, it's kind of interesting because I think that a lot of people think about PSMA PET for detection, but the quality of life factor is huge. So it sounds like that anyone who has, you know, 4 plus 4 Gleason 8 prostate cancer, if they're not getting a PSMA PET scan, they're getting suboptimal care then. That is correct. So it's exciting that we have all these medical advancements, but, you know, around the country, it takes a while for the medical community to adopt all this. Are other oncologists doing short-term? Like, what is someone going to encounter being diagnosed with Gleason 8, um, maybe in an academic center or in a normal oncology office? Well, the possibility of a PSMA PET scan may not even come up in the conversation. You have to be prepared for that possibility. Usually when doctors are confronted with that, they'll say, hey, yeah, okay. Um, we're still finding problems with uh, private insurances paying for PSMA PET scans and people uh, that have recently been diagnosed with Gleason 8. So those are, those are definitely roadblocks. What people should be prepared for is what, uh, what we had been advocating for the last 10, 15 years, and that is with 4 plus 4, 
Uh, people need to have definitive treatment of the prostate. We prefer radiation over surgery. Uh, they need to have uh, prophylactic radiation to their pelvic lymph nodes. This can be done very safely now. And they need to have 18 months of androgen uh, deprivation, testosterone blockade, to uh, shrivel up and work with the radiation to optimize cure rates. This has uh, historically been the standard, and there really was no dispute about it because the studies, 10-year outcome studies, show that you get the best cure rates uh, with that approach. There is still a strong surgical community that wants to operate on these individuals, and uh, the long-term outcomes with surgery alone are really sad. Uh, cure rates with Gleason 8 overall are going to be around 75-80% with the type of uh, hormone and radiation treatment that I outlined for you. The cure rates of Gleason 8 with surgery are in the range of 30 to 40%. How can anyone justify that? Well, commonly people get radiation right after surgery in these high-grade tumors. They'll have a positive margin and, and they'll add some radiation right after and um, or if at the first sign of relapse. And if you add radiation to surgery, you get pretty good long-term control. Sadly, these people are unnecessarily getting two treatments, surgery plus radiation, when they could have just done the radiation from the get-go. Uh, so I, I always get up on my soapbox about uh, the disadvantages of surgery, and I apologize for that. But to answer your question, historically, Gleason 8, when we didn't have PSMA PET scans, involved 18 months of hormone deprivation, pelvic lymph node radiation and definitive radiation therapy with brachytherapy, IMRT or SBRT or proton therapy to the prostate itself. So I know in a lot of doctor's offices, IMRT and beam radiation is a pretty big conversation, but brachytherapy still isn't a big conversation because a lot of people just don't do it. So can you explain what brachytherapy is and the benefits in the long-term studies? Well, they have randomized studies comparing brachytherapy with beam radiation, showing 20% higher cure rates. It's not terribly surprising that that would be the case because the dose that the brachytherapist can deliver with the seed implant is higher and can be given more safely than beaming it through healthy tissue. Why isn't brachytherapy more popular? It is reimbursed in a uh, fashion that dis there's a disincentive for radiation therapists to use it. They don't get paid very much to do brachytherapy. And so it has fallen by the by. Regular radiation treatment, IMRT, all these things are very lucrative for the doctors. They work reasonably well, but especially with Gleason 8, we want optimal cure rates. We do not want to have any residual cancer left behind in the prostate, and therefore brachytherapy should be considered the standard of care in people with high-grade tumors. So in brachy, there's temporary seeds and permanent seeds. Is one better than the other? They're equally good. It's a skilled procedure just like surgery, so you have to look for someone that's done that particular type of implant a lot so that they're good at it. If you have qualified people, either approach is fine. I think one question I've seen come up quite often is that somebody gets a PSMA PET scan, they have Gleason 8 and it's localized to the prostate, but they're wondering can they do focal therapy for Gleason 8 or is that dangerous? Oh, I think focal therapy would be fine. Uh, this is one of the beauties of PSMA PET scans. In addition to now having biopsy outcomes and MRI outcomes, color Doppler up outcomes, we've got PSMA PET scans, which also give you an idea if there's any cancer on the other side of the gland. Uh, so some people aren't aware of the fact that PSMA PET scans are fantastic for finding cancer throughout the body, but they're also good at finding whether there's any cancer in the prostate and where in the prostate. So if we can confirm that there's no uh, cancer on the contralateral side, focal therapy is a reasonable option. Uh, again, you have to seek out doctors dedicated to focal therapy. It's, a, it's an art form, and you can't just you know, go to someone who's in his learning curve. So before PSMA, we had three TMRIs, which were kind of our gold standard to make sure that, you know, the disease was unilateral, it was localized to the prostate. How does MRI be, how is MRI going to be used now with PSMA being in the picture? Yeah, MRI staging has become much more mainstream. Uh, in the past, we were just encouraging people to do it. Now, of course, we're telling people not only to do it, but to try and find uh, qualified centers that have experience doing it right. It is a very useful tool, uh, even more precise than PSMA inside the prostate. PSMA is very good at determining if cancer is present. MRI is very good at determining the actual dimensions and location. It just has more resolution than a PSMA PET scan does. So I, I would think that practically anyone with Gleason 4 plus 4 will have had a prostate MRI before decisions are made about surgery and radiation or focal therapy or whole prostate therapy. I just assume that an MRI staging is a standard part of 
uh, modern workup for people with newly diagnosed uh, high-risk high prostate cancer, Gleason 4 plus 4. Today we talked about Gleason 8 prostate cancer, and there are three things that I want you to think about when it comes to this. Number one, do you, what type of Gleason 8 do you have? Is it localized? Is it in the lymph nodes? Has it metastasized? That particular information will change the way it is treated. Based off that information, you decide on what type of treatments that you want to go through. Um, you know, is it going to be long-term hormone therapy, short-course hormone therapy? There are different factors at play. And then the third thing I want you to think about that I think oftentimes because of the world we live in and how scary cancer is, we don't think about quality of life afterwards. Prostate cancer should really be thought of more as a chronic disease than a death sentence. And it's really important to hold all three factors as equally important. As you heard Dr. Scholl say, the cure rates are really good in Gleason 8. So please do your research, take your time to decide on the right treatment for you, and hold your quality of life as equally important. If you need more information, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and please subscribe to this YouTube channel. We have all sorts of new videos coming out every single week, and we truly want to help. I hope you have a great week. Much love.